Alternate history makes for really good fiction. Not only is it a good source for creative storytelling, but it also gives us an intimate connection with the story by asking, what if the world went down another path? Now, in the alternate history community, you have your generics, right? What if Germany won World War II? Yeah, heard of it. What if the Confederacy won the Civil War? Okay, a bit more interesting. What if the Cold War continued into the 21st century, resulting in a nuclear apocalypse? Oh, and what if nobody wins World War I? Whoa, now we're talking! This, ladies and gentlemen, is the plot behind the alternate history story, Red Flood, a mod for the World War II grand strategy game, Hearts of Iron 4. In Red Flood, World War I takes a drastic new turn, as the war is abruptly halted by internal revolutions on both sides of the conflict. There is no Treaty of Versailles, as the pre-war nations are left in ruins and have become hosts to the radical ideas of the 20th century. It is one of these ideas that are found only in Red Flood that makes the mod so iconic known only as Accelerationism. Created out of the ashes of the nations left in turmoil after the Great War, it embodies many of the cultural and economic changes happening during the Roaring Twenties. Vibrant youth culture, mass consumerism, availability of home appliances and cars, scientific progress, and new art movements like Surrealism, Futurism, and Deco, all put into a blender and then put on steroids. That is what makes up Accelerationism. And so, myself and a fellow YouTuber, Civi, are going to cover the topics of this very unique ideology. Not only that, but we're also going to cover a bit of the story of Red Flood and build upon it to make it something more interesting and more practical. It's 1918, and the German Empire is on the verge of victory, having occupied Paris and leaving the French army in ruins. However, their campaign falters by continental-wide revolutions. In Germany, the working class seizes power, they kill Kaiser Wilhelm, and declared a communist republic. Soon the front lines fall, and France is swallowed up by national unrest, street battles and riots lasting from day till night. After a year of national upheaval, Charles Nordgesser, an accomplished aviator and flying ace of the Great War, leads a military coup to destroy what's left of the ruined nation. Though France was now secure under what is called the Escadron Regime, its people lost ties to the old ways of French society. As the nation recovers, multiple counterculture movements began to rise up. They venerate industrial society, idolize the surrealist art, and opposes traditional societal norms many lived under. These include cultural clubs, fraternities, activist groups, and others, such as Francais Futuristes, Asafel, Excelere, Las Neo Simonia, Le Pas Fram, and others, gaining a massive influence. Even among people like Nordkesser, who began to give away positions to elite accelerationists, most notably the philosopher and playboy George Baptiste, known historically for his stay on taboos, and Anton Antoine, a surrealist dramatist, actor, and theater director. In 1927, a referendum was held, but on the steps of the National Assembly, Charles Nordkesser, accompanied by Baptiste and Atad, declared the dissolving of the dictatorship and declared a new society called the Avant-Garde Regime. As for Atard, he became de facto leader, declaring himself the name The Patron. For accelerationism, it's more of a cultural revolution rather than a political theory. It wasn't focused on economics or how politics run, just as long as it fuels the cultural revolution. But let me try and describe this organized chaos. At the top, the patron acts as a figurehead, with regional leaders campaigning to win over the patron's favor. Regions are managed with a good deal autonomy, with each trying to best implicate the accelerationist agenda, with nationalized businesses and armed forces acting as agencies to enforce the many economic, scientific, and cultural projects proposed by both sides. To stimulate economic growth, the National Assembly abolishes all antitrust laws and encourage companies to form cartels to secure their market position. This leads France to turning into a black market economy, and all the foul play that is in a black market, such as organized crime, arms smuggling, human trafficking, government corruption, drug trading, private policing, turning the Palace of Versailles into a brothel to help fund government management, you know, all that no good stuff. Science is no exception to this. Given accelerationism's close ties to innovation, the regime gives free reign in this field, making France a lead nation in the field of science and engineering, even if those inventions are considered unorthodox. Culturally, things start to get wacky. 
the regime puts a lot of support into new outlandish art and artists, most of which center around motion, the supernatural, war, speed, industrialization, and sensory stimulation. They also go out of the way to abolish marital laws, making it the first nation to support free love. Not to mention the hedonistic parties they help in funding, which by the way is the only time a city runs out of alcohol. To just give you a glimpse of these parties, in Red Flood, there is the 1936 New Year's celebrations, where alongside ornate costumes and the roar of fireworks and artillery, massive bonfires are being fueled by old Renaissance paintings. In particular, Attard, out of a very salacious act of defiance, ejaculates onto a 500-year-old painting before setting it on fire. Now, with such a rebellious society, wouldn't there be opposition? Why, yes specifically those of the rural population, whom since 1918 been marginalized, impoverished, and exploited by the urban population. They are represented by a militant organization called the Druids, led by Mark Arger, the father of deaccelerationism. They are very traditionalist, paganistic, anti-capitalist, anti-industrialist, anti-liberal, anti-socialist, and have been notorious to commit terrorist actions on major cities, with their paramilitary wing known as the Green Shirts. In ending this section, France is the only major power to be under accelerationist rule. But in places outside the avant-garde regime, accelerationism is on the rise, most notably in Italy. To help me with this subject, I'm going to transfer it over to the YouTube comedian Civi, who will discuss what accelerationism means both as a theory and in the peninsula. Thanks, Sparks. Now, to start off, we should really understand what the whole acceleration movement was all about. For one, this movement was founded by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, and it was a social and artistic movement. The whole center for this ideology and movement was to be really alive, to push humanity as far as possible, and that was the center of this ideology. The ideology with its fever zealousness and its tendencies towards extremes kind of looked at the car as an extension of humanity and wanted to worship it as the ultimate art piece as its engine and its motor kind of shot out like, like a machine gun. While this ideology didn't have much mainstream attraction, it did actually have a fairly prominent following within northern Italy and the Adriatic coast. And there was even a legitimate state that was founded, the Regency of Canaro, founded by Gabriele de Annunzio during the 1918 revolutions. Much like France, they wanted to take control through culture. The problem was there was a huge suppression that was upon the accelerationist movement. So Martini and Azzonio planned a march on Rome to potentially seize power. The accelerationist movement sees struggle as a center point for humanity and kind of a cure for humanity's insatiable lust for progress. And this mentality kind of goes to other areas as well, as it kind of sees certain things that are, say, to least problematic to the progress of, well, humanity. They see things such as museums, libraries, and utilitarian cowardice as in the way of futurist and or the accelerationist ideals of what humanity should be. Now, you may be asking, why libraries and museums and taboos, why? Well, they see such things as like a cemetery. They see these things as merely a pastime for remembering the dead. And anything that glorifies the past should be rooted out. And because this is an accelerationist, futurist ideology, they see the youth as key. Because, again, they're youthful, and we're gonna have fun editing this. <laughs> this ideology is a very fascinating one, in which embodies the mantra of all or nothing. It kind of believes with enough zealousness and with enough speed, it can kind of shoot for the stars. And they too, like Elon Musk, can ride his car to the great unknown. Thank you, Sparks, and thank you for having me. Accelerationism in France and Italy are the only places that poses a serious influence in Europe. But what about in the Americas? 
In French Guinea, specifically, the founder of the Surrealist movement, André Breton, fashions this small little colony into a sandbox society for new ideas and concepts to flock to, but also has a dark side of subjecting the native peoples there and committing piracy on neighboring countries. In the United States, accelerationism is a popularity on the East and West Coast, the most significant of which is the American Technic Society, that uses some cultural aesthetics in France, but wants the nation to be run by those of science and engineering. They have notable members like Henry Ford, John W. Davis, Oppenheimer, you know, the founder of the nuclear bomb, and are secretly planning to overthrow the U.S. government with the help of U.S. General Smedley Butler and mafia leaders like El Capone. Like in real history, the population of rural America didn't experience the Roaring Twenties. In fact, in Red Flood, the Roaring Twenties continued well into the Thirties, and American farmers were left abandoned and taken advantage of by those of the cities. It would be the Dust Bowl and the abuse that the Oklahomans faced that would inspire an American writer to oppose the decadent industrial society, even if it means that he destroys industrial society in America. And his name is Ted Sazin- No, no, no. John Steinbeck. Anyway, John Steinbeck, a former socialist, forms the American Frontier Movement, a deaccelerationist mass movement that seeks to turn back the clock to a time when homesteading was the way to go for the American people. His program demands equal representation of farmers and the rights to secede from the Union if nothing gets offered. As the 40s roll around, this becomes a national crisis, with the gap between urban and rural America becoming wider and wider. The feeling nations have towards accelerationism are variable. Some say it promotes amoral behavior, while others say it's the best way to achieve societal advancement. In fact, the chairman of the German Socialist Republic, Gregor Strasser, titled it as being bourgeois decadence. But there are exceptions, particularly in the former lands of Russia. In Red Flood, the Russian Revolution fails and the Bolsheviks are forced to flee to newly made countries bordering Russia. It is here that they create an accelerationism of their own. In Ukraine, for example, the mad biologist Tofin Masenko has organized many lead scientists into bioengineering of plants and humans in order to create what he calls the true breadwinners of Europe. In the fictional country of Zoltrosia, which is made up of northeast China and the Siberian coast, it is much like a sandbox society. Not only is it a home for diverse cultures, but also a place for new thinkers and revolutionaries, such as objectivist thinker Ayn Rand and communist revolutionary Leon Trotsky. As for the accelerationists, they are the Zatra state. Made up of scientists and aristocrats, they are led by the scientist and futurist Alexei Gastev. They propose for a society to be fully integrated with machines, and have developed a personal religion worshipping machine inventions as an act of divinity. Zatra is known for converting many of the cities of Zoltrasia into giant metropolitan areas, including the capital city of Harbin, where their crown jewel is that of the Tower of Babel. Not only is it the headquarters for the Zatra state, but is the control station where radio towers transmit propaganda, media, and futurist music to the cities, like that of the industrial symphonies of Azare Amarov. Now, as seen in France and America, it does face opposition, known as the Free Peasant Rebellion, led by former Bolshevik general Chepayev, who combines communism with peasant lifestyle, creating what he terms primitive socialism. When a famine struck the nation in 1936, the FPR membership skyrocketed, and now lead a private war against all those who have been profiting off of their misery.
In ending this video, Acceleracism is a very interesting idea that's been used in Red Foot lore, and what makes the game very iconic. If I wanted to get into the whole lore behind Red Flood, that video would take hours. And it's more fun to discover the deep lore when playing the game. This was to give a summarized analysis of a particular subject of the lore, and to be a good world building video. But not, and I repeat, not to spread a new type of ideology. I mean, we already have our mascots, we have this flag right here, so don't get any smart ideas on trying to bring this into real life, alright? We don't need, like, a bunch of people on the internet to come to a local city, tear down a bunch of monuments, and cause mayhem, alright? It is I, a Mario, leader of the Teacher's Italian Party. Now, this person- What did I just say? Know? Gabriela de Anunzio in <laughs> me. <laughs> Actually, a state being founded, the <laughs> me, the <laughs> me state. <laughs>